services connecting to the world. From Abuja, Nigeria's capital territory, this is Around News Live. This is MBN Network Media News for all races connecting to the world. I called for the report and I said, look, there are issues here. 
things. Do you know on my own, on my own, I put a call across to him, which ordinarily I'm not supposed to. Those who honor him as a governor, as a past, immediate past governor. Sir, there are issues. I've seen this case file. Can you just call? Let, me, let us clarify these issues. He said, ah, sir, I thank you, my brother. I know, uh, but I, I can't come. There's one lady, I don't know what her name is. Uh, she may say it. Uh, that she, she learned she had set, you know, she has surrounded the agency with over 100 journalists, uh, you know, to come and embarrass him and intimidate him and all kind of stuff. I said, okay, if that is your fear, I'm going to pass you through my own gate, special man's gate. You will come to my floor. We will accord you that respect. I will invite my operator, operatives. They will come and interrogate you or interview you in my own office. What could be more honorable than that? In my own office. To so allay the fear. Ah, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You know what he said? Uh, but can not they come to my village? Uh, that's what he told me. Can they come to my village to, to come and say, I, I told you. He also brought it, he sent a message to him. My dad of investor sent a message to him. And the ESCC chairman appears resolute. He made some categorical statement. Some of the people that we thought are crusaders, they are on the payroll board, you know. And that's true. We are, we, are, we are investigating it. We are building a case against everyone involved. Whether you are a governor or not, we are building a case. Let the whole public hear. We are building a case against those who obstructed justice. You are sitting, you have immunity today, you won't have immunity forever. We are not stopping here. It's been watch listed all over the world. It can only run. They said there's no law in this country that we are following. Let all of us declare that we are a state of barrier. Everybody go and do what they like. Like I said, I don't mind the outcome of these case, but the right thing must be done. If I don't, we don't see this case through, we just, we, I won't have any moral right to accuse anybody of corruption in Nigeria. I, I, I will resign. Yeah, yeah, Bello's case is not the only matter the agency is pursuing at the moment. More revelations emerge on the schemes that threaten the economy. Suddenly we discover that there are even people within the system who are doing worse than Binance. Because of the P2P and all of that, it was shocking. Just yesterday, I had calls to freeze in over 300 accounts. One of those accounts, we discovered that the guy that traded the volume of over 50 billion in the last one year. Nobody knew outside the financial regulation. Over 300 accounts. In illicit forest trading that would have led to another crash in, an, in the next one week if we didn't move yesterday. What about the uproar of the cross dresser Bob Risky and recent prosecutions over Nara mutilation? Some people have taken us to cleaners on each of spring money and all of that. It's not the work of EFCC, it's not the responsibility of EFCC. Go and look at our law very well. I'm a lawyer myself. And I did promise I won't do anything outside the rule of law. What do you understand by economic sabotage? What is the meaning of economic crime? I'm not just only, my mandate is not only to investigate financial crimes. The mandate goes as far as investigating the economic crime. Illegal miners are now on the radar of the anti graft agency. Some seizures we understand are already made to see what Nigeria loses every day. Every day to elect a manager we wait for this country. As at the last count, how many trucks of mineral resources have we seized? 40, sir. We have over 40. You know what that means? Of, of uh, lithium and all kinds of expensive raw uh, natural resources. The Obukoyede then responds to questions first on the investigation on former Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika. That's not personal. It's not about this rigor. It's about the system. It's about our process. It's about it's about national interest. So don't let us single out someone that if ELGC is running after this rigor. No, please. No, it's a system. If you had asked me, are we investigating issues that have to do with the Ministry of Aviation? And I would tell you straight away that yes, we are investigating it. And then about the suspended Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, better do, and some of the issues around the ministry's finances. What we are investigating started during the title. Do you think it started during Anima? Do you think it even started during, during you know, Sadia? Before that ministry was established, every single company that was allocated to that ministry is what we are investigating. As I said, the FCC 
is asking Nigerians for support as the chairman believes if the commission fails, the nation, according to him, has failed. Meanwhile, Justice Emeka Mwiti of the Federal High Court of Abuja has fixed May the 10th for ruling in an application by a former governor of Kogi State, Yahya Bello, seeking an order to set aside the arrest warrant issued on him. Justice Mwiti also ordered the EFCC to serve a copy of the charge against him through his lawyer, Abdul Wahab Mohammed, which was done in the open court due to his absence in court for his arraignment. Our correspondent, Emanuela Ekele, reports. The arraignment of the former governor of Kogi State, Mr. Yahaya Bello, has been stalled for the second time. He was not present in court. On April 18th, the EFCC applied for a substituted service of his charge and proof of evidence against Mr. Bello after the ex-governor's lead counsel, Abdul Wahab Mohammed, declined to receive the documents in the open court. At the resumed sitting today, the judge ordered the EFCC to serve the charge and proof of evidence on Mr. Mohammed. After the service was done, one of the counsel to Mr. Bello, Mr. Adedrayo Adedipe, requested the court to revoke the arrest warrant, citing that the charge hadn't been served when the warrant was issued. He mentioned Mr. Bello's willingness to appear in court, but expressed concerns about fair treatment. He argued for justice for the prosecution, defendant and public. In response, EFCC's counsel, Kemi Pinheiro, urged that arraignment must proceed without setting aside the warrant. EFCC added that they wouldn't execute the warrant if Mr. Bello's counsel ensures his presence at the next hearing. Justice Emeka Nwiti adjourned the case and set May 10 for ruling on Mr. Bello's applications. Emanuela. Staying with the money laundering saga, the State House of Assembly has asked the EFCC to vacate the wanted tag that it has placed on the name and picture of the former Kogi State Governor, Mr. Yahya Bello. This formed part of the resolutions reached by the lawmakers during the House plenary today, following a matter of urgent public importance presented by the member representing Ajankuta State constituency in the House, Honorable Jibrin Abu. In their resolutions, the lawmakers noted that the Commission should not allow itself to become a tool of political vendetta, blackmail, or intimidation against any individual through personal grudges, persecution, and campaign of calumny to tarnish the image of personalities from Kogi State, especially Mr. Yahya Bello. According to the lawmakers, they are not against the EFCC doing its job, but should do it within the ambit of the law. In the meantime, a group under the aegis of Forum of Concerned Citizens of Kogi State is urging the immediate past governor of the state, Mr. Yahya Bello, to submit himself to the EFCC to clear his name on the allegations of financial mismanagement against him. At a news conference in Abuja, the group led by a former deputy governor of the state, Mr. Sinan Achuba, described as shameful and illegal the action stopping the anti-graft agency from arresting Mr. Bello at his residence in Abuja. Yaya Bello is currently holed up in Kogi State Government House, and all efforts should be taken to bring him to justice. That relying on moralizing and all appeal to conscience will not yield any result or move him to voluntarily surrender to EFCC. Because as the saying goes, the guilty are always afraid. It is that same fear that is making him to mobilize people to demonstrate in Lagos and today is also mobilizing, mobilizing people to demonstrate in Kogi State in Lokoya. Moreover, Governor Dodo should be requested to immediately surrender his abductee, that is the Ayabelo, because he is the one that came to Begazi Street and took the Ayabelo away from the hands of the, the EFCC. On the 17th of April, under the cover of his uh, immunity. Well, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC, is set to arraign the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin M. Mephile, for approving the printing of 684.5 million naira at the rate of 18.96 billion naira. In the fresh four-count charge filed against it, 
The EFCC alleged that Mr. Mefele disobeyed the direction of law with intent to cause injury to the public during his implementation of the Naira swap policy of the administration of former President Mohamed Buhari. The Antigraft Agency also accused Mr. Mefele of unlawfully approving the withdrawal of 124.8 billion R from the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the Federation. Channel's television gathered that the former Syrian government will be arraigned on these counts before Justice M. E. Aneni of the FCTI Court, Abuja, on April the 30th. In part two after the break, federal government raises a bar on distribution of palliatives, explores option of using traditional rulers as a channel of reaching out to the less vulnerable in the society. Please stay with us. Media news for all races connecting you to the world. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, watching the news, make us a reminder of our top stories. The FCC chairman, Ola Ulukwede, claims former Kogi State Governor Yahayat Bello took $700,000 of state money to pay his children's school fees in advance, vows to ensure Mr. Bello is prosecuted. Federal High Court Abuja orders service of Governor Bello through his lawyer as the Kogi State House of Assembly demand the listing of the ex-governor's name from EFCC wanted list. The FCC is set to arraign the former governor of the CBN, Mr. Godwin Emefili, on fresh charges for approving the printing of 684.5 billion naira at the rate of 18.96 billion naira. And 10th session of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development Goals opens in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, as some member countries lament the slow delivery of the SDGs. Aircraft with 83 passengers and registration number 5NBKI flying from Abuja to Lagos today veered off the runway, referred to as runway excursion at the Montella Mohammed International Airport, Lagos. Dana Air in the statement explains that the passengers were safely disembarked with no injuries and it had reported the incident to the Nigerian Safety Investigation Board and the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Safety Investigation Bureau says it has commenced an investigation into the incident. In a statement, the Director General of the NSIB, Captain Alex Badi, explains that a GO team has been dispatched to the incident scene and has begun inquiries. The NCAA, on its part, says it will be looking to implement the safety recommendations from the aircraft incident investigation. River State Governor Similai Fubara has implemented a minor cabinet reshuffle in the state. The reshuffle changes the positions previously held by the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice, Professor Zakias Adango, and the Commissioner for Finance, Isaac Kamalu. Professor Adango will now head the Ministry of Special Duties, a governor's office, while Mr. Kamalu will run the Ministry of Employment, Generation, and Economic Empowerment. Both commissioners have resigned from their positions at the height of the political crisis in the state. However, they were reinstated as part of the peace agreement initiated by President Bola Tinubu. Well, the federal government plans to roll out more palliatives for Nigerians as part of measures to cushion the impact of the present economic downturn. According to the government, 20% of the palliatives will be routed through traditional and faith-based institutions to ensure they reach those they are meant for. Vice President Kashim Shetima said this at a one-day high-level dialogue of faith leaders on nutrition in Nigeria. Our State House correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. His Excellency, the devastating effect of malnutrition in Nigeria is what this gathering of medical professionals, government agencies, and traditional rulers seek to discuss. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 
Vice President Kashim Shatima is the special guest of honor and he explains that the welfare of the ordinary citizens is a top priority to the current government. Prominent religious and traditional leaders are also in attendance, an indication that the current economic situation is not for government alone to handle, but a challenge that needs everyone's attention. Imagine four out of Nigerian children who are stunted, whose cognitive capability is detracted because of malnutrition and what it means for the future prosperity of this country. And in this light, the role of faith leaders cannot be overstated. While religious and traditional leaders give their support to the cause, the former CBN governor and chairman of the Nutrition Society of Nigeria, Israel Ines Danusi Lamido, says the root factors responsible for malnutrition and hunger need to be addressed. The way we work hand in hand with the Accelerating Nutrition Resource in Nigeria project and other stakeholders to ensure that our congregations are educated about and engaged in improving nutrition. The governments at all level have a very big task. When you don't get somebody to eat a balanced diet when you can't even find simple food to eat. So feeding people is very important. Keeping our farms safe for farmers is very important because they have to produce food. People, especially those who have low income, must learn to manage the size of their family because these responsibilities are given to go on to maintain your wife, to give her nutrition when she's pregnant, to maintain the child. It's fine when you have one, two, or three children. When you begin to have 15, 16, 17 children, you simply cannot do it. In the aftermath of fuel subsidy removal, the federal government rolled out palliatives for vulnerable Nigerians. However, some religious leaders here feel left out in the distribution process, a situation which Vice President Kashim Shatima notes that it will be addressed as the government plans another phase of palliative distribution and a school feeding program. The President has approved that 20% of the palliatives in terms of food intervention be routed through our religious organizations and the foundation of the institutions. The Sangaya schools, the mission schools, will be specially targeted for such intervention. The Vice President also launches the Accelerating Nutrition Resource in Nigeria Salmon Guides and Faith Perspectives on Nutrition. From the Presidential Villa, Emperor Simon. Outside the issues of the country, efforts needed to step up the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals is the focus of the 10th session of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable Development, which has opened in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. In 2024, member states and their partners are past midway in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and are yet to progress on most MDGs is off track. Now, the 10th session is holding at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa's headquarters in the East African nation. Our correspondent, Ayola Kassi, reports. For about a week now, informal meetings, stakeholders' workshops, side events have been taking place here at the headquarters of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And their focus is majorly on coding for girls, climate change, science, technology, food systems. And the major takeaway has been most countries on the continent will not meet the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. So as delegator right here for the 10th session of the African Regional Forum on Sustainable development. They hope to address the shortcomings and capitalize on the emerging opportunities for the continent. Leading the delegate is Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Anna Mohamed, who not only urged African countries to scale up action on key transitions and investment pathways and accelerate progress towards the sustainable development goals, but also asked them to take up the opportunities of critical transitions available both regionally and nationally that can help the continent to make progress and to the international banks and development partners, her message is simple. At the heart of this, like so much else, is finance. Now is the time to rethink austerity-oriented international policies, reduce debt servicing costs, 
and ensure a more equitable global taxation system so that African countries can do what we know they want to do, to invest more, more efficiently, more equitably in capacities and the skills of their people. With poverty, hunger, insecurity and large-scale deprivation on the continent, many here agree African governments cannot afford to continue with business as usual and most of them must go back to the basics. The basics we know are that we need to look into it and make sure that we create strong institutions. Institutions that are going to be accountable to the citizens and to deliver what the citizens need. If we need to talk about development, if we need to talk about security and stability, if we need to talk about good governance, what we need indeed is for governments to do the basics of catering for their people. For the next two days, delegate here will, among other things, be deliberating and transformative, innovative and ambitious interventions necessary to reinforce the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and Agenda 2063, as well as refining policies on eradicating poverty on the continent and this time of multiple crisis. From UNECA headquarters in Addis Ababa, so let's head to the nation's capital and Victoria lunch on the standing bar because the very latest from our British team. Hello, Victoria. Over to you. Good to see you too, Ayo. Lib British International School Abuja has been shut down. Now this follows a viral video that surfaced in social media where a student whose name is said to be Nantira was being bullied and assaulted by her fellow students. During an exclusive interview with the Minister of Women Affairs, Mrs. Uju Kennedy Ohaneye, Following her visit to the school, she revealed that an investigation has been opened up into the school's activities and pending the outcome of the school, pending the outcome, the school will be shut down for the next few days. Our correspondent Kumi Abolwade reports. <laughs> That is the viral video which surfaced online where a student in Lee British International School Abuja is being bullied by her fellow students. The video drew public outrage on social media and even birthed a trending hashtag, Justice for Natura. Following this incident, Channel's television visited a school in Guarimpa to speak to the management. We're currently at the lead British International School in Abuja where the viral video of a student being bullied surfaced online. We just approached the school premises but we were denied access for security operatives at this gate. Meanwhile, some of the students on grounds of anonymity allege that bullying is a major challenge they face as students and several complaints have been made to the management who made no effort to end bullying. Is this uh, bullying goes on in this school? How often? They're not, they're not allowing you guys inside. Yes, they're not allowing us inside. <laughs> Earlier in the day, the Minister of Women Affairs paid a visit to the school, where she met with the victim's mother as well as the school's management. Back at her office, Mrs. Kennedy talks to us about her visit and what needs to be done. But we've closed them for three days. By Monday, they should be back to school. But there are consequences. The school must lose something to be able to learn their lessons. The school expelled the students, which I am not comfortable with. I won't allow the students to be expelled. You know, when you err, you punish the child, but give the child another chance. In the meantime, the Federal Ministry of Education held a meeting with the school's management earlier today. Though there are no broad statistics of bullying in Nigeria schools, a research carried out by ResearchGate in two Nigerian schools showed a 78 prevalence. <laughs> For Nigeria, it appears there's an urgent need for the enactment of laws and policies against bullying in Nigerian schools. And the implementation of such laws and policies must be vigorous.
Meanwhile, there's a Child Rights Act which can form a basis for protection of these minors. From the nation's capital, Kumbi ahead on the news at 10, the Central Bank of Nigeria announces another round of discounted dollar sales to the overshout operators as a Naira official rate hits one month low against the dollar. That's on business news to join us again. Indian Network Media News for our races connecting you to the world. Another story is the Assistant Inspector General of Police in charge of ICT, AIG Ben Okulu, who represented the IGP at the public dialogue of state police yesterday, has clarified a statement credited to him on the matter, which has drawn reactions from many quarters. Mr. Okulu said his statement at a one-day event in Abuja that Nigeria is not ready for a decentralized police force is a personal view and does not reflect the stance of the police force. According to him, the position of the force will be made known soon. I called that yesterday, 22nd April 2024. I represented the force at a conference on national security and state police. At the Continental Hotel, where I made expression of some opinion and advertently attributed to the Inspector General of Police. Those expressions are my personal opinion to stimulate discussion. They do not represent the position of the IG nor the force leadership. The Inspector General of Police, in due course, will make the position of the force on this known. And one person has been reportedly killed in a fight that broke out between groups of students of the Ladoke Akintola University of Technology of Bomosho Oil State. It was gathered that a misunderstanding led to a fight between the two groups of students at a popular joint in the town as they were celebrating the convocation ceremony. The owner of the club was said to have invited the police when the fight escalated to put the situation under control. Unfortunately, one life was said to have been lost to one other sustained injuries as the clash turned violent. And that's it from the nation's capital. It's now back to you, Aya, for the rest of the news at 10. Many thanks, Victoria. The federal government has announced the recovery of 57 billion naira from the 5.2 trillion naira liabilities owed by the Federal Inland Revenue Service and Ministries, Departments and Agencies of Government. The Permanent Secretary Special Duties of the Federal Ministry of Finance, Mr. Okonko Ekana Udo, made the disclosure today in Enugu during a sensitization workshop on federal government debt recovery drive through Project Lighthouse Program for the Southeast Geopolitical Zone. Mr. Callum stated that the debts came to the spotlight from data aggregated from over 5,000 debtors across more than 93 MDAs. He explains that although the debt aggregation effort is still ongoing, approximately 57 billion R has been recovered so far from this amount due to concerted efforts on the part of stakeholders and the federal government. It is close that the ministry in this regard has however taken steps to address the revenue loophole through the issuance of a ministerial directive to all MDAs to aggregate all government debt across the public finance space as well as having a single window on the prof credit profile of government. In its continued efforts to contribute to the educational advancement of Nigeria, Coleman Wise and Cables Limited has donated a two-story building to Bell's University of Technology, Ota Ogo State. The building named after the chairman of the company, Chief Solomon Onofuokon, is, des is designated to house the postgraduate studies in the institution. It's the commissioning of the Ashwaju Solomon Onofuokon building, donated by Coleman Wires and Cables Limited, in honor of its chairman to Bell's University of Technology, Ota Obu State. Present to witness the occasion, our former president and promoter of Bell's University of Technology, Chief Olusha Gwambasujo, Pro-Chancellor and former Minister of Power, Professor Bart Naji, Vice-Chancellor of the University, Professor Benjamin Ojedimo, 
traditional rulers, school management, and students. The edifice symbolizes a collaboration between the institution and its partners. This building represents more than just a physical structure. It symbolizes hope, progress, and every potential for greatness. It is a hub for innovation, creativity, and collaboration. Where minds will meet, ideas will be born, and dreams will be realized. They receive a pat on the back for a job well done. Believe me, at this juncture, to especially welcome and appreciate as well Dr. S.K. on our for welcome for his landmark contributions to the orderly development rules of the university through the donation of this magnificent building we are functioning today. Your kind gesture in this unique way is well acknowledged and appreciated and will go a long way in enhancing teaching and learning in the university. In his remarks, former President Tolusha Kumbasindra thanks the donor and management of the institution for their cooperation. State and other senior public relations practitioners have called for a high sense of responsibility and patriotism in the management of the nation's image. Well, they made a call in Abdelkuta, the state capital, at the opening session of the meeting week celebration of the Niger Public Relations. It is the maiden edition of the Niger Public Relations Week, and the cultural center, Kuto, Abdelkuta, the state capital, welcomes council members, delegates, veterans, guests consultants and practitioners. Others who attended the occasion include the state governor, Dakwa Biodun, members of the state executive council, the national president and the chairman of the council of the NIPR, the general manager of Channels Television's Academy, Kingsley Ranta, representatives of the Minister of Information and the governor of the CBN, among other distinguished personalities across the country. The national president of the NIPR, Dr. Ike Nelyako, addresses the gathering and reiterates the need for effective public relations. It's important for leaders to understand that without giving public relations a place, they will not be able to take advantage of the best that is available to them. Public relations used to be at the level of officers. Today, public relations is no longer at the level of managers. Public relations has become a leadership function. On this part, the Minister of Information and National Orientation, represented by the Director General of the National Orientation Agency, Larry Isawulu, affirms that federal government policies and initiatives are already yielding positive results. This awareness of the centrality of public relations has played an important role in shaping my South Point agenda, improving security, rule of law, fighting corruption, and improving the plain state on which people, particularly companies of threats, is already showing positive results for this country. This message of hope is also shared by the representatives of the central bank governor. 
The central bank will provide solid guidance, enhance transparency, and maintain effective communication with the public to anchor expectations and build trust among our stakeholders. Next, the NIPR Council and Dutch government are prepared to offer their state influence forward, just as he promises not to betray the confidence reposed in him by the Council. Again, let me thank you for this investiture and considering it worthy to be your patron. I promise to uphold all the tenets of your institute and I will continue to be a great image maker for our state and for Nigeria at large. The Nigeria Public Relations Week is the largest convocation of professionals, policymakers, leaders of industry, and members of the Global Alliance for the Public and Communication Management spread across 126 countries. The West African Container Terminal, WACT on Air, has commenced its barge and operations partnership with the Beto Terminal and Port at the Port Harcourt Port in River State. Now, the country's CEO of APM Terminals, owners of WACT, says the intention behind the partnership is to improve satisfaction for their customers. Major operations are ongoing at the West African Container Terminal Wacht on Airport as the company is set to commence a partnership deal with Ibeto Terminal and Port at the Port Harcourt Port. Wacht is a subsidiary of APM Terminals and their partnership with Ibeto Terminals and Ports will see them moving containers from Pune to Port Harcourt by barge as opposed to the trucking method currently in operation. Members of the APM Terminals Management team explain why the Ibeto group was chosen. The reason why we picked Ibeto is by the time they got there, we saw what was on the ground. We saw the owner of the facilities. In fact, we saw the ability still in them. But it has the fashion. It has the fire. At APM Terminals, our purpose is to improve the life for all. And uh, to find a way to bring the cargo closer to the customer, to bring this import and export and empty containers closer to the customer, and to avoid him the hassle of trucking those containers by the road to Pony is a real pleasure. On his part, the country's CEO of APM Terminals says this is the culmination of months of negotiation between both organizations. For a couple of years, where we've been working with uh, our shipping line partners as well as uh, Ibeto to uh, to develop a product that enhances the uh, the offering that we have here from the uh, from the terminal, so that uh, the customers can choose between taking delivery uh, of their containers through the traditional way through uh, trucking or using the barge, uh, thereby bypassing uh, some sometimes difficult road conditions. The management of Ibeto Group is also upbeat about the deal. This has been a long waited project that has finally uh, finalized. So uh, the whole if, when, how is all over because uh, we are in the business now, like you see, uh, there is already something working. It's not when, how will it go. So it, it is a groundbreaking um, partnership and we're happy to be there. With the signing of the MOU between both organizations, it is expected that there will now be seamless barging of containers from Onei port to the Ibeto seaport for swift delivery to their final destination. It's now time for some business news with John Carroll Rogers. MBM Network Media, news for our races, connecting you to the world. Transactions 
The latest sale is part of the financial market regulator's efforts to ensure enough liquidity in the market and halt the recent depreciation of the Naira in both the NAFTA and parallel market. Now, the federal government has commenced arrangements to reward micro, small and medium enterprises in the country with houses, cars and even cash prizes as part of events to mark this year's MSMEs Week. The program is part of a wide base incentive to support innovation, standardization, scaling and to encourage the small businesses to favorably compete with their foreign counterparts. Speaking at a press briefing in Abuja, Mr. Kimutala Dekule Johnson, who is the Senior Special Assistant to President Bola Tinubu on Job Creation and MSMEs, said government is also considering a program to replicate the apprenticeship style of trade learning common to the Igbos across the country. Now, the Lagos State government says it plans to roll out 2,000 compressed natural gas buses before December and 231 electric vehicles by June 2024. The state's Commissioner for Transportation, Mr. Olua Shion Oshiemi, who disclosed this today at a briefing in Nkeja, explained that the move is part of government's plan to ensure that Lagos residents have a cleaner means of transportation. He said that the government is partnering with private firms under a public-private partnership arrangement to acquire the Synergy buses, which will be distributed in two batches of 1,000 and would ease the burden of the petrol subsidy removal on the residents of Nigeria's largest commercial city. From there, we head to the local stock market uh, for today's figures, and here's Laddie Williams for the report. to the stock market report where it looks like profit taking is not allowing the bull to solidify its position in this trading week as the all share index gives up yesterday's gain. Practically all of it at this point. 0.35% down 99,311 points for the all share index still sitting uh, below that 100,000 psychological level at this time. Market cap 56.16 trillion. Let's look at the um, get a shot now. We see uh, Suno Assurance, that's the financial services top of the counter, up with a big uh, 10%. Uh, one now, 10 cover. We see Japol Gold also on that counter. It's been a while or so, um, Japol Gold on the Guinness counter. And we have CAP PLC um, right there. Let's look at the top uh, losers now. FBNA chair, one of the uh, food guys, the tier one banks, down 9.88%. With the tier one banks, known as the food guys, dipping just UBA. Um, in the green in that counter. We also have Honey of Flour down 9.89% at 3 Naira and 19 Cabo. So it's a widely negative market breadth today with 16 gainers against 25 declining stocks. Well, that's how your money performed today. The bear returns. <laughs> Thank you, Laddie, as we close business news with more market figures from around the world. This is the East tonight. Back to you, Ayo, today. This is NBN Network Media News for all races connecting you to the world. Media news for all races connecting you to the world. News around the world in sight. Protests over the war in Gaza have taken hold at a handful of elite U.S. universities as officials.
scramble to defuse demonstrations. Police moved to break up an encampment at New York University, making a number of arrests. Dozens of students were arrested at Yale earlier in the day, while Columbia University cancelled in-person classes. The White House has condemned anti-Semitic incidents that have marred some demonstrations. Protests and heated debates about the Israel-Gaza war and free speech have rocked U.S. campuses since the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October, which prompted Israel's campaign in Gaza. French officials say five people, including a seven-year-old girl, have died while trying to cross the English Channel in the early hours of Tuesday. They said the victims were trying to get to the UK on an overloaded boat carrying 112 migrants. Authorities said the boat ran aground on a sandbank after leaving Wimereau near Bologna before continuing on. A few hundred meters from the coast, the engine stopped and several people fell into the water. The Abbe Normandie patrol boat was immediately tasked by the maritime prefect to rescue the shipwrecked crew. The sailors found several people in the boat who were unconscious and in great difficulty. Despite resuscitation attempts, five of them died. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has said the deaths of those five people have been tragic. He was speaking to journalists en route to Poland after the news of the deaths first emerged. He said breaking the business model of criminal gangs who organised the crossings was a matter of compassion. On Monday, Parliament approved the government's safety of Rwanda bill. Ukraine is suspending consular services for male citizens aged 18 to 60 abroad as part of a drive to beef up numbers joining the military. I would recommend all critics to shut up. Foreign Minister Dmitry Kaleba said protecting the rights of Ukrainians was still key, but the main priority is to protect our homeland from destruction during Russia's full-scale invasion. Russia has a big advantage in numbers and weapons on the battlefield. Kyiv recently lowered the age of mobilization from 27 to 25. The head of the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, has said 3 million children in Haiti are in need of humanitarian assistance as continued gang violence hampers aid delivery. Millions of children at greater risk of child marriage and child labor. Catherine Russell said the situation in Haiti was catastrophic and growing worse by the day. She told a meeting of the UN Security Council that in many areas essential services had collapsed. Meanwhile, a transitional presidential council has still not been sworn in. Australia's leader has called Elon Musk an arrogant billionaire in an escalating feud over X's reluctance to remove footage of a church stabbing. On Monday, an Australian court ordered Mr Musk's social media firm, formerly called Twitter, to hide videos of last week's attack in Sydney. X previously said it would comply pending a legal challenge. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese's criticism followed Mr Musk using a meme to accuse his government of censorship. On Tuesday, Mr. Albanese said Mr. Musk thinks he's above the law, but also above common decency. Well, this guy is showing his arrogance. He's a billionaire uh, over there in the United States who thinks he's above Australian law. This isn't about censorship. It's about common sense and common decency. And Elon Musk should show some. And there was joyful singing and cheers in Western Democratic Republic of Congo as a procession emerged from an underground cave bearing an antique wooden figure of a Belgian colonial officer. <laughs> the ballet sculpture was made in the area in the 1930s when Congo was under Belgium's brutal colonial rule. An artist collective led a long-running campaign for its return from a U.S. museum. The sculpture, which depicts a colonial administrator who was killed during a worker revolt at the plantation in 1931, is now considered a symbol of colonial resistance. It is back in Lusanga for a six-month display after spending more than 50 years in Virginia. Its homecoming coincides with growing global pressure on Western institutions to repatriate artifacts taken during the colonial era. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back. <laughs>
connecting you to the world. From Abuja, Nigeria's capital territory, this is Around News Live. This is MBN Network Media News for all races connecting to the world.